Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. On April 14, director Martin Scorsese appeared live via Zoom at the Center for Italian Modern Art, CIMA, to make some opening comments about the need to preserve Italian sheet music of the kind once sold at E. Rossi and Company in Little Italy. Calandra's Director of Academic and Cultural Programs, Dr. Joseph Shora, delivered a talk entitled, Preserving Italian Immigrant Music Making. After his lecture, Dr. Shora conducted an interview with Ernie Rossi of E. Rossi and Company. Through the years growing up in the shop, uh, listening to all the music, and especially mostly Neapolitan music, it, uh, it really touched me, and uh, it's, just, it's just beautiful. I mean, and I think it's something that will continue and continue and continue. I don't think the music will ever die. That's one thing that'll live forever and ever. To everybody down there at the Center for Italian Modern Art, CIMA, and the Calandria Institute at CUNY, CUNY, really thanks for inviting me to the event, Preserving Italian Immigrant music making. Thank you, Nicola Luki, for contacting me. And thank you to Joseph Shora, who, um, as I do, feels that uh, the preservation and reviving of Italian immigrant music making is something which is so essential to really understanding and appreciating the contribution of Italian Americans in this country. Um, I know that Ernie Rossi is going to be interviewed later. And I wanted to say hello to him and say, I really am sorry, I cannot get down there tonight um, due to the editing schedule of my next film. You know, Rossi's shop on, um, on Grand and Mulberry, uh, I mean, I grew up uh, around it. I, I, I was on Elizabeth Street between Prince and Houston, uh, but that was my whole neighborhood for between Houston and uh, Canal Street, you know? Um, and so um, the Rossi shop was something that's a fixture of my whole, formative experience um, of, uh, of life, really. Um, and to the point where back, I think in 1972, I went in there, I was about to make Mean Streets. I went in there and picked up a beautiful Sicilian cart, which I have here in the next room, still have it. Oh, uh, other um, uh, other, fic other uh, memorabilia, uh, that, that sort of thing from Italian American culture, Italian culture, and particularly some beautiful albums of folk music of Stornelli actually, uh, which I wound up uh, using, utilizing it to, for inspiration for the, the really the rest of my life. Um, and I know that there's going to be a short, I, I think I saw a, a documentary on, on Ernie uh, Rossi. And I understand that he's got this, like a treasure trove of his grandfather's sheet music, which was published under the Rossi name. And I think it's extremely important to preserve. And I hope Ernie's going to find a way to make it available for scholars of the future and music music lovers also. Um, and now actually I look forward to Dr. Shora's talk and maybe hearing some of the music for as long as I can. The current exhibit, Staging Injustices, directly addresses the topic of immigration, a historical fact that defined and shaped Italy what historian Mark Choate called an immigrant nation. So I have a daunting task of presenting today on Italian immigrant music making. I'll be concentrating on popular artists who performed in Italian, Neapolitan, Sicilian, and other Italian languages, and who toured and recorded with major US uh, commercial recording companies. And here I just present the covers of three books, some really wonderful books published both in Italy and in the United States regarding Italian immigrant music making. In addition to the books, of course, there are also numerous reproductions in CD form and even online of Italian immigrant music, whether they're being reproduced here in the United States or in Italy. One place to begin is with musica popolare, folk music. Like the diverse languages spoken in Italy, folk music has a range of vocal styles. So I'd like to play a snippet of a, a field recording made by Italian anthropologist Carlo Bianco of, that she made in Chicago and New York City during the early 1960s, a song of derision. The singer of this was Bettina Di Domenico, 
originally from San Arsenio in Salerno province, but she took great delight um, singing this song in her Mulberry Street apartment, a musical testament to the masculine need in small peasant society to publicly renounce oneself and distance oneself from a relationship gone bad and through public humiliation. <laughs> One of the most impressive folk instruments in the panoply of musica popolare is the zampogna, or the bagpipe, traditionally played by shepherds. Found throughout Italy, the zampogna has come to be associated with the Christmas season. In 1917, the first known commercial recording of zampogna Christmas music was recorded here in New York City by an unknown musician believed to be Rocco Castello, who immigrated from Ar Armento um, in Basilicata and lived in Greenwich Village. This is a photograph of his grandson, um, Gabriele Cicala. Gabriele decided that it was important to donate this and preserve this in a certain way. David Marker and I, we helped to bring this to the New York Historical Society, where it is currently being restored and will eventually be put on permanent display. So I'm going to sh play a clip. It's a really bad recording, but a little clip of Rocco and another musician who's playing the ceramella, an oboe, a reed oboe, and playing one of these Christmas songs. So when one thinks of Italian popular mu music, one instrument stands out among all others, and that is the mandolin. String ensembles, including mandolins, guitars, and even banjos, uh, were recorded and performed throughout New York City and in, in the United States. So we know that these Italian instrumentalists cross ethnic lines, sometimes playing in Latin and Eastern European groups and recording um, various types of repertoire. So let me play a little bit of I Treb Abruzzesi, which is really kind of exciting because you'll hear uh, the banjo being played. <laughs> So it was not only Italian music making traditions that crossed the Atlantic, but also the luthier's craft took root in the United States. Accordions from amateurs to professionals were pervasive part of Italian American social lives and soundscapes. Virtuosi like the brothers Guido and Pietro Derio, Charles Magnante, and the creators of the Valtaro Musette style that emerged in New York City nightclubs during the 1930s and 1940s from older northern Italian traditions were regionally and nationally recognized uh, recording artists. Here, uh, Guido Derio. The lost world of Italian immigrant singers and performers has thankfully been resurrected by scholars and record collectors who have published and issued CDs with liner notes, extensive liner notes, who have made us increasingly aware of the stars of the Italian American stage, radio, and recordings, like Clara Stella, Gennaro Amato, Giuseppe Milano, and so many others. These artists performed on the stage in New York City for the Gaiety Theater in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, a flyer from the Brooklyn Academy of Music with, a, a, I mean, just a host of some of the, the greats of Italian uh, immigrant music making. These artists had contracts with U.S. recording companies, both minor and major. According to the Library of Congress, by 1940, more music and language recordings had been made by Italian Americans than by any other English-speaking group. 
The University of California, Santa Barbara, now houses the collection of Brooklyn-born Anthony John Grande, which is a treasure trove of anyone interested in Italian immigrant music. And we at the Calandra Institute have been taking in um, sheet music and recordings um, as sort of a safe haven for these sort of immigrant refugees that have been lost to history with the idea of passing them on to a reputable um, and established uh, museum or archive. Gilles de Mignonette was a great, fabulous star. And Gilles de Mignonette was dubbed La Carusiana, a female Caruso, and also the queen of the immigrants for the many songs she sung about her longing for the old country. But her repertoire was varied and included patriotic songs, topical tunes, um, and the American-born Jimmy Roselli has stated more than once that Mignonette was a great influence on his singing. Some of you may know the tragic story about Gilda Mignonette. She was going back to Naples, not to live, but to going back to Naples, and she died just a couple of days before she entered port. Why is Farfaiello so important? With his wildly popular musical comedy routines, Farfaiello, the little flower, was a sympathetic observer of Italian immigrants' quotidian travails expressed in the macronic immigrant parlance that combined Italian, Neapolitan, and English. His character studies of the immigrant community expressed the trials and tribulations of the working class poor. We are also fortunate that the 1932 film, The Movie Actor, has been preserved with Farfaiello by the Eastman Museum in Rochester, and of course, we have to give special thanks to Martin Scorsese, who helped underwrite the funding to the restoration of this film. An agent is looking for somebody who could play multiple characters, and which is what Farfaiello did. And Farfaiello shows up, comes in as himself as Eduardo Migliaccio, sings a song, great voice. <laughs> And the agent says, look, we're looking for someone who can play different types of characters. And he proceeds to come in, comes back dressed as a woman. And they said, no, we're looking for someone who could play characters. Comes back as a gangster, rejected again, comes back as a, as a drunk. And then he's rejected again. And in the end, Farfaiello returns and says, that was me. <laughs> Americana and Napoli. Oh, yeah. Via Rosa was cut a quite a figure on stage when she dressed as a man to sing tunes associated with men such as Guapo and Uzapatore. Her interpretations of an unwed mother in the recording E Pentito is both heart-wrenching and daring for publicly addressing the theme at the time. For Rosa, the question of women's liberation is directly tied to modernity in the song Preferisco il Novecento, I prefer the 20th century. And I'm just gonna read a little bit of a translation. My fiance is not modern at all, he likes the 19th century. Instead, I like the 20th century. I prefer the 20th century. Oh, freedom, it's so beautiful. There is no denying that today's women is no longer the vile maidservant. They don't need to wear skirts anymore and I'll put this skirt around your neck. The prolific Alfredo Bacchetta is noteworthy because of two recordings he sang in 1927 in defense of the condemned anarchist Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Tears of the Condemned, and Letter for Sacco from his son. I'm gonna play a theatrical routine called The Protest on Behalf of Sacco and Vanzetti, which I'm really uh, honored to say that I successfully campaigned to have this recording listed on the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry for 2019. <laughs> The various voices are speaking in standard Italian, but with um, 
accented Italian, so you have somebody who's speaking with a Neapolitan accent, a Sicilian accent, a Bruzzese accent, a Barese accent, and they're arguing about what they've heard. And in the end, there's this big rally that they all come together. This is Farfaiello in blackface, dressed as Hali Selassie. We have some of this music that is pertaining to the radical left, to anarchist socialism, etc. but there is a host of music that is pro-fascist, pro-Mussolini. Alfredo Bacchetta, who had leftist leanings um, and sang these two, wrote and sang these two songs for Sacco and Vanzetti, also recorded and wrote a song called The Hymn to Mussolini. One of the things that the sheet music tells us about, of course, is information about the composers and lyricists. The other important information that we see here is the publishers and those who own the copyright. And you see the Rossi um, information at the bottom. Rossi's were one of a number of different publishers in New York City, and this is not even the full list. I would be remiss if I did not mention, even in passing, the composer, lyricist, and publisher Francesco Penino, Francis Ford Coppola's maternal grandfather. I have to thank uh, Mr. Coppola for giving me image of the Senza Mamma. And the logo of Penino's thriving publishing company embodies this connection between Naples and New York City. And of course, the image from on the left is the, um, from The Godfather II, which was based on Penino's Sceneggiata. Sceneggiata was a th short theatrical piece, which in the middle of was the musical song that was really the impetus for writing the entire theatrical piece. In 1910, Ernesto Rossi founded a publishing company and store in Lower Manhattan's Little Italy. The store, E. Rossi and Company, sold piano rolls, records, sheet music, and books. At some point, Rossi purchased portions of the Edizione Penino that we just saw and the Italian book company's portfolios. Uh, Ern Ernesto Rossi's sons, Eduardo, Pasquale, and Mario were all involved in various aspects of the musical business with Luigi and his son, um, Ernest, ultimately running the store. Here's a song I wrote for my wife. The title is Italian, but the lyrics are in English. It's called Far l'amore con te, to make love with you. Far l'amore con te, you're all I dream of. Far l'amore con te is all I care to do. Far l'amore con te, every waking hour. Far l'amore My mother is the one that got me involved in music, but really. Um, I had a cousin that was a guitar teacher, music teacher, and my mother said to him, can you give my son guitar lessons? So he said yes. So every week I would go out to Avenue X in Brooklyn, take the train, go to the other end of Brooklyn. My mother would give me money to pay him, and I paid him for lessons, and uh, I started to learn to play the guitar. But he was teaching me classical music, but then he got a divorce and there went my lessons. So, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> e. Rossi and Company, established 1910 by my grandfather, Ernesto Rossi. This is my father's father from the city of Naples. And my mother's side, it's from Avellino. She went to school in Italy. She got back here probably somewhere in mid 1930s. My father was born here, but his father and mother came from the city of Naples. But my dad spoke a fluent Neapolitan dialect. My grandfather used to go back to Italy every year and participate in the song festival in Italy called Petit Grotta. I have booklets from the 1920s and 30s of Petit Grotta. Every year that when he went back to Naples, he would publish a new group of songs and put out a new publication. Okay. I have tons and tons of sheet music and books all in storage in all different locations.
and eventually we're going to put it together and uh, try to put an Irashi collection out. I remember growing up in the shop and remembered um, singers coming in from Italy. I remember Connie Francis. She sang um, a song published by my grandfather called Come Bella Stagiorna. I remember um, hearing that your father carried Gilda Mignonette's suitcase or yes, a briefcase. Yes, yes, yeah. When she used to perform, he would uh, bring her uh, bags and suitcase to the theater and back. And she was good friends with my grandmother also. Yeah, my father would tell me stories also about him delivering pianola rolls as a kid. So one time he had pianola rolls to deliver into Brooklyn. When he got to the shop, he, he told the shopkeeper, look, these are new songs that just came out. But when he looked up on the shelf, the shopkeeper already had the, the music on the shelf. So what was happening was that the company that made the music rolls for them, what they did was make more than my grandfather had ordered and sold them under the table. So they were bootlegging from way back. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, my dad always spoke about Neapolitan music, and, uh, and it influenced me a lot as a child. Yeah. Things have certainly changed in Little Italy. Oh, things have changed a lot, and not for the best. It's gradually decaying, gradually, little by little, disappearing. I mean, the moratorium uh, during the pandemic kept the landlords from evicting anyone. But once they ended that moratorium, the guillotine came out. And there are many, many restaurants in Little Italy and many other stores that have been subpoenaed to go to court. And the landlords want their back rent paid. And so it's a tough situation. I wish the city could do something. I'm hoping that we could keep, you know, stay there. I mean, I was born at 146 Mulberry Street on top of Angelo's restaurant. 1950, and Little Italy in 1950s and the 60s was just beautiful. And every block, you had somebody in the family, or you had friends and neighbors. It was a very, very close neighborhood. I just hope that the little that we have left, we could somehow preserve it. You said that the Neapolitan music will never die. No, it will But when in your shop, how often do you get people coming in actually looking for Neapolitan music, let alone well, this older music that we've been talking about today? Not in the last several years. It's becoming less and less and less. Well, also, people could download things. And people are not listening to it. I mean, difference in the language. I mean, a lot of those old Neapolitan so songs have a lot of heart and soul in them. You could actually, you could hear the singer singing, crying. And the song Cartolina Nabla. It's about uh, an immigrant that got a postcard. He looked at the postcard, he seen the Bay of Naples. He seen Mount Vesuvius and became melancholy and became homesick. I wish that somehow that music could be preserved, maybe changed a little bit for a younger audience to appreciate, and I think that can be done. I was gonna say, how do you imagine the younger generation doing that, but this older music was so specific to the time. I yes, mean, that's you know, true. It's, you know, it's not like O Solo Mio, where it's just kind of this, you know, chestnut of a song that gets played over and over again. That's true, that's true. Some of this music just sort of doesn't even resonate with this, any generation uh, that we're of uh, the 21st century. But you know, sometimes things, What's old becomes new again. Mm -hmm. And through the cycle of life, things, things that happened 50 years ago may happen again. Right. Look, there's another war going on. Who right. expected that would happen? Right. So, Well, there's a singer named Jen Esposito that performs a lot of songs that I write. And she does a lot of the Italian-American songs. She's very good, but you know, like, the audience is gradually diminishing. Right. So how can we get that audience back? I guess we're going to have to make some changes. You were telling me before that Francis Ford Coppola came to the store yes. uh, a couple of times. Yes, he did. Back in somewhere in the 80s, uh, the old police headquarters, which is just right near here, 
Um, at the time, the police department had moved out. Uh, the Italian Lyra Club had it, and they were going to make a museum or something out of it, which nothing ever happened. But Francis Ford Coppola happened to come in the store. My father knew him, and my dad told him, why don't you go take a look at the old police headquarters around the corner, buy it for a studio. So, so my father says, Ernie, walk, walk, and walk Mr. Coppola to the old police headquarters. And I did. We walked there. We walked around. And uh, nothing ever happened. And a few years ago, he happened to stop by the, in the store. And I told him, I says, too bad you didn't buy that building to turn it into a studio. He said, you know, knowing what I know now, it would have been a no-brainer. But at the time, it wasn't, wasn't worth it. That was my Uncle Eddie, Eduardo de Rossi, and my Aunt Conchetta Rossi. And uh, my Uncle Eddie was invited to go to uh, California many times by Coppola's mom and dad. But he never did. I don't know why he didn't. He should have took him up on it. One time I sang Father Lamore Conte in the store. And after I sang it, this guy came up to me and he said, I like the way you sang that song. I said, well, you know, I wrote it, but I prefer somebody else to sing it. He says, no, 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 I like the way you did it. So we were arguing back and forth. And then finally I said, sir, what do you do? He looked at me and he said, I'm Dion. He took off his hat, took off his glasses. I says, oh my God, you're Dion. You gave me a compliment. I just died and went to heaven. He says, give me the guitar. He took my guitar and he sang two or three songs to me. I'll never forget it. This next song I'm going to sing to you, uh, I started writing it about seven years ago. I never actually completed it. It's been recorded by Jen Esposito. And... I completed this song after my wife passed away 11 months ago from COVID. The day I buried her, I wrote a letter to her, my wife, and I, wrote, and I finished the lyrics of this song, and I wrote it out, and I put it with her. And it's called The Other Side of Forever. been gone for such a long, long time, and I can still hear you calling, calling out my name. Memories are all that I have left until today. We meet again. That's when we'll meet again. Thank you for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.